Introduction An explosive radiological dispersal device, or RDD, is an explosive device that disperses radioactive material. It can create ballistic fragments of radioactive material, shown here as yellow cubes. The dark purple area around the detonation site in each fragment, indicates a dangerous radiation area. The smoke generated by the blast can also be radioactive. The smoke carried by the wind will contaminate buildings and ground surfaces in its path. This science-based response planning guidance for the response to a radiological dispersal device detonation, is intended for first responders and local response agencies, and is based on realistic estimates of the possible consequences. This guidance document includes recommendation actions for emergency management, responders, and the public. It also includes capability recommendations, such as personal protective equipment, and templates for public messaging. The planning guidance is organized into missions and tactics. There are five time-phased missions. 1. Recognize. Presence of radiation confirmed with two readings. 2. Inform. Information is relayed to the EOC. The EOC triggers public messaging alerts, notifies partners, and requests assistance. 3. Initiate. Life-saving rescue operations and securing the scene. 4. Measure and map. Ground measurements are recorded at specific locations to determine the extent of the danger. 5. Evacuate and monitor. Sheltered civilians will be instructed to evacuate the area and to participate in voluntary contamination screenings. Within the five missions there are 10 tactics, which are grouped to give more focus to individual operational areas. The tactics are numbered, but not implied to be sequential. Missions and tactics overlap on the response timeline. This is a flexible guidance document. Each individual jurisdiction will use it in different ways based on their preferred approach. Let's get started. The Recognize Mission When responding to a radiological dispersal device, the first step is recognizing that a bomb of this type has been detonated, and that radiation, is present at the scene of the explosion. The Recognize Mission, consists of two tactics. Tactic 1. Initial Response and On-Scene Recognition First responders are equipped with radiation detection equipment that is in continuous use when responding to an explosion. Use of radiation detectors, provides first responders with situational awareness to promptly reveal the presence of radiation, and associated hazards during a response. The recognized mission, consists of two tactics. Tactic 2, confirm the presence of radiation. Once radiation is initially detected, first responders need to confirm the presence of radiation by taking, a minimum of, two readings, in two locations, using two separate radiation detection instruments. This tactic is completed in order to avoid, unnecessarily alarming the public, due to a false positive reading, from one malfunctioning detector or a localized legitimate radiation source. Using two readings, taken at two locations, by two separate instruments can help mitigate the misidentification, of an RDD detonation. The two measurements should be taken, a minimum of 50 feet, apart from each other. Detectors should be held 3 feet, above the ground. Both meters should register levels greater than, 3 to 5 times, the natural background, to signify the presence of elevated radioactivity levels. Knowledge of area-specific background radiation, which may include natural variations, is critical for identifying elevated radiation levels. Local agencies should take steps to understand, and map, normal background radiation levels in their jurisdiction. The INFORM mission After the presence of radiation is confirmed, it should be a priority to inform, responders and the public, of the initial default hot zone and shelter-in-place zone, and to notify local, state, and federal authorities to request assistance. Tactic 3, Give Report from the Scene The on-scene incident commander notifies command centers, including the EOC, if already activated, that the explosion was from an RDD. The incident commander also informs all arriving emergency personnel on scene that radiation is present. Notifications should be made to The Emergency Management Agency Dispatch State and Federal Agency Headquarters Hospitals and Emergency Medical Services The initial notification should include the following information The location of detonation The two initial radiation readings The direction of any smoke Damage and number of casualties Other hazards at the scene 
responding EMS, and receiving hospitals, should be notified to prepare for receipt and treatment of casualties that may be radiologically contaminated, to ensure proper transport and treatment of the victims. An incident map is created and shared with key agencies. In this example, the free tool, Rad Responder, is being used to identify the site of the explosion, and to upload and display radiation measurements. This data map, over time, will be updated with protective action zones, and additional radiological measurement data. Real-time information sharing is critical to ensuring the safety of both responders, and the public. The Inform Mission Tactic 4, Issue Protective Actions to the Public when radiation is confirmed at the scene, emergency management should issue pre-approved public messaging with immediate shelter-in-place instructions for the affected areas. The initial shelter-in-place area for public safety should be 500 meters, or 1600 feet, in all directions from the detonation point. In some instances, asking whole neighborhoods to shelter-in-place simplifies messaging. Use all media available to disseminate the message as quickly as possible without waiting to schedule a press conference. The overall intent is to have as many people as possible within the 500 meter radius, shelter inside. The Inform Mission Tactic 5, Notify Partners and Request Assistance Emergency management notifies local, state, FEMA, and other federal partners, that an RDD has detonated. This can be done using existing protocols, and procedures, to notify and request assistance. Table 2 of the RDD Response Guidance contains a list of specialized resources, and the support they can provide. Such resources include, the State Radiation Control Authority which provides radiological expertise, and has the authority, for managing radiological issues in your community. The National Guard Civil Support Team, which are regionally located teams, with expertise in weapons of mass destruction. The Interagency Modeling and Atmospheric Assessment Center for Modeling and Downwind Consequence Prediction. The Federal Advisory Team for the Environment, Food, and Health, which provides protective action recommendations. The Department of Energy maintains several key assets, such as The Aerial Measuring System which can rapidly map contamination using aircraft located on both coasts. The Radiological Assistance Program which has specialized teams of radiation experts located throughout the nation. The Radiation Emergency Assistance Center and Training Site which provides support to the medical aspects of a radiological incident. The Federal Radiological Monitoring and Assessment Center which provides remote and on-scene assistance in monitoring coordination and radiological assessments. During an emergency, all support requests should be routed through official channels, typically from local to state, to FEMA region. Although some capabilities can provide remote support immediately, most state and federal assets will not be on the scene during the first 100 minutes but should be requested early so that they arrive as soon as possible. Incident data should be shared electronically with local, state, and federal agencies. Tools and services such as RAD Responder allow first responders and emergency managers to develop a common operating picture. The first 100 minutes the detonation of a radiological dispersal device may produce radioactive ballistic fragments that can give off radiation. In this example, the dangerous radiation zone around the fragment is shown in dark purple. The hot zone is shown in light purple. The detonation may also produce radioactive smoke. In an urban environment, this smoke can be carried in several different directions and may be a respirable hazard for those in the area within the first 15 minutes after the detonation. The smoke may also contaminate surfaces downwind possibly causing elevated radiation levels. This simulation tracks the responder's exposure from all of the radioactive fragments and smoke contamination. The exposure rate at the responder's location is shown by the top number and represents what would be seen on a handheld instrument. This guidance uses the following hazard zone definitions. The hot zone is any exposure rate greater than 0.01 R per hour, or 10 R per hour. This zone can be safely operated in by responders for life-saving and property protection activities, provided that unnecessary activities and time spent in this zone is minimized. Naming conventions for this zone vary, consult your local doctrine. The dangerous radiation zone is defined as any area greater than 10 R per hour. Activities in this zone should be restricted to time-sensitive, mission-critical activities such as immediate life-saving, and should be performed as rapidly as possible. The total dose received by the responder is shown by the bottom number. In the United States, occupational workers typically have an annual dose guidance of 5 rem per year. 
There are no dose limits for emergency response activities. Provided that all reasonable dose reduction actions have been taken, a 10 rem dose is justified for property protection, and a 25 rem dose is justified for life-saving activities. Again, these are not limits, and higher doses can be justified for the protection of large populations, when the responder is fully aware of the risks involved. The Initiate Mission Start life-saving operations immediately on arrival, followed by securing and managing the scene, without waiting for radiation monitoring to begin. This mission consists of tactics numbered 6, and 7, and is conducted concurrently with the previous tactics and missions. Tactic 6, Initiate Life-Saving Rescue Operations. First responders immediately begin life-saving rescue operations including, search and rescue, fire suppression, and medical triage and treatment. These operations are not delayed because of the presence of radiation. Life-saving rescue operations must take priority over conducting radiological measurements, or decontamination. Time working in the hot zone, should be minimized, and managed by supervisors to ensure responder safety, by keeping potential radiological exposure, as low as reasonably achievable. This is known as, the ALARA, principle. First responders should wear appropriate personal protective equipment, to reduce the intake of airborne radioactivity, and help mitigate contamination, while performing life-saving rescue operations. Although desirable, radiological monitoring equipment is not required for rescue operations. The existence of a significant dangerous radiation zone greater than 10 R per hour is unlikely, but possible. Even in an extreme case, with a very large radioactive source, causing an extended area of dangerous radiation fields at the incident site, it would be unlikely that responders would receive a dose higher than, the 25 REM guideline for life-saving operations. Rapid rescue of casualties and minimizing time spent at the scene of an RDD is the best method for keeping radiation exposures alara. By 15 minutes after the initial detonation, the concentrations of airborne radioactivity will have substantially decreased, and the primary inhalation hazard will be from the resuspension of contamination on the ground. First responders should be alert for any possible localized high radiation levels, due to partially or non-dispersed radioactive sources. Responders should also be alert for the possibility of a radioactive fragment, that may have been embedded in a person. If not identified during triage, this type of wound could be a source of prolonged exposure to the patient, and the responders who are treating the injured person. During Tactic 6, emergency management should consider issuing a second public message that includes information about the radiological hazard, and reiterates the shelter-in-place message. Message templates can be found in Annex 2 of the document. The Initiate Mission Tactic 7. Secure and Manage the Scene Law enforcement, in conjunction with fire, will help establish initial public safety boundaries around the scene. Initially, these boundaries should use default distances from location of the explosion and include 1. Designating everything within 20 meters of the explosion a crime scene. This area can be a significant radiation hazard and only immediate life safety actions should be conducted. 2. Establishing a safety perimeter for the initial hot zone, at 250 meters. 3. Enforcing the initial shelter-in-place zone, set at 500 meters. If ground measurements identify significant contamination away from the incident scene, the initial 500-meter shelter-in-place boundary will be updated to include an additional 2,000 meters in the direction of contamination travel. No one should enter the crime scene around the detonation point unless there is a life safety need. This area should remain undisturbed until the FBI arrive to conduct their initial forensic assessment. If the scene includes potentially radioactive fragments, first responders should avoid handling any pieces. Fragments and debris should instead be marked and avoided to help reduce responder exposure. Law enforcement should focus on directing those who are within these boundaries to safety, and help identify injured or contaminated individuals. Crowd and traffic control should be used to keep people from entering potentially hazardous areas. In addition to managing safety boundaries, law enforcement, in conjunction with fire, will help characterize and clear hazards prior to operations that do not involve life-saving. The Measure and Map Mission Tactic 8 Measure and map radiation levels to characterize the extent of the radiological contamination and adjust hazard zones. Once life-saving operations have been concluded, hazard zone boundaries will be updated based on gamma dose rates and contamination levels of alpha and beta radiation. The hot zone should be defined by Gamma exposure rates that exceed 10 mR per hour 
beta and gamma surface contamination that exceeds 60,000 disintegrations per minute (dpm) per square centimeter when measured at half an inch above the ground, or alpha contamination that exceeds 6,000 dpm per square centimeter when measured at a quarter inch above the ground. A dangerous radiation zone should be designated wherever exposure rates exceed 10 R per hour. These zones should be marked and avoided if possible. It is important to remember, that measurements are secondary to the primary mission of performing life-saving rescue operations. Once life-saving operations have been adequately resourced, any additional resources can be used to monitor, and map the radiological hazards. The collected radiological incident data will be reviewed by an analyst with expertise in interpreting radiological data. The on-scene incident commander will collect this data, by assigning three strike teams to take measurements, in two phases. These phases are described on pages 22 to 32 of the RDD response guidance. The Evacuated Monitor Mission Evacuate and monitor populations, from impacted areas, and begin to identify allocations to open community reception centers for screening, and population monitoring. Tactic 9, Commence Phased Evacuations First responders establish evacuation routes, and exit points, based on radiological measurements taken in the field. Having identified hazards and contaminated areas, responders will help the evacuating population avoid hazardous areas. If possible, try to phase the release of populations who are sheltered in place within these areas to ensure an orderly evacuation. However, responders should expect mass self-evacuations, from all over the jurisdiction, regardless of whether populations are in the impacted area, or not. If it is determined that there was a significant amount of contaminated smoke released, expect the size of the evacuation zone to potentially expand and the extent of the contamination is determined. While evacuations are underway, a press conference should be conducted that covers the following topics. 1. Updates regarding the response effort. 2. Evacuation information. 3. Instructions for self-decontamination. 4. Other protective actions as needed. See Annex 2 of the RDD guidance for template messages and key information that should be messaged to the public. The Evacuate and Monitor, Mission. Tactic 10, Monitor and Decontaminate. As practical and without creating a significant evacuation delay, initiate procedures to control the spread of contamination. Anyone with physical trauma or injury should be sent directly to medical care. Once evacuation routes and exit points are identified out of the hot zone, teams of first responders should establish contamination screening checkpoints at the designated exit points in areas without an elevated radiation background caused by the event. Responders should encourage evacuating individuals from the hot zone to participate in voluntary contamination screenings. Do not quarantine or detain evacuating individuals, even if they decline to undergo contamination screening. Various radiological detection instruments can be used for contamination screening. In this example, a pancake GM detector is moved at approximately 2 feet per second, and 6 inches away from the surface of the individual's body. The normal range of background radiation is 0 to 80 counts per minute. If more than twice background is detected during the survey, move in for an initial screening decision measurement. In this example, an initial screening decision criteria of 1000 CPM was not exceeded so no action is necessary. Continue the survey by moving the detection probe along the indicated path, shown here. Maintain a probe distance of 6 inches from the subject's body, once again, the detector has registered more than two times background. Move probe within one inch for decision measurement. In this example, the detector is now registering more than 1000 counts per minute, which is above the designated initial screening decision level and the subject should be directed to on-site decontamination efforts if available. Initial screening techniques should be adjusted to ensure screening wait times do not become excessive. Examples of adjusted techniques include. 1. Increase initial screening decision level to 10,000 counts per minute. 2. Survey only likely areas to be contaminated, such as the hands and feet. 3. Use alternative equipment, such as dose rate instruments or radiation pagers, to support screening activities. All evacuees should be provided information on self-decontamination, and encouraged to visit a community reception center, or CRC, once they are established for further evaluation. To review all of the information presented in these videos, you can download the PDF of the RDD response guidance here.